Public key cryptography has allowed us to solve one problem that Alice and Bob might face when they're trying to exchange information securely online. So that's this idea that I don't want my messages to be altered, in I don't want my messages to be decrypted. So I don't want my private information to be read on the way from Alice to Bob. However, there's another kind of attack that we haven't considered yet. And that's this idea. So let's say that Alice is sending a message to Bob. So, and we're gonna use Bob's public key to do this. So Alice takes her message and she takes the plain text and cre she creates the cipher text, the encrypted message using Bob's public key. And then she starts to transmit that message out across the internet. But let's say that there's a malicious party in the middle and that malicious party wants to fool Bob into thinking that he received some message from Alice that he didn't actually receive. And so what that, um, that, what that malicious party is going to do is it's going to remove this message, so we'll call this M, and then it's going to create a new message M prime. Now here's the problem. It can encrypt that message using Bob's public key because Bob's public key is public. Everybody can use it. So this adversary is going to take Alice's message, get rid of it, create a new message to Bob that's completely different and send that message on its way. So when Bob received the message, he'll, he'll decrypt it, but there's this second um, question that we have to deal with, which is how does Bob know that a message came from Alice? So this is actually pretty cool. So uh, remember, we have this idea of a trapdoor function. So for example, in Bob's case, um, there, if I start with a message and I encrypt it using Bob's public key, to get the encrypted message, then only Bob, by using his private key, can decrypt the message and recover the original contents. But here's something that's important to notice, which is that these are just transformations on the message contents. So this is something that everybody can do, and this is something that only Bob can do, or only Alice can do if we're using Alice's keys. So how do I use this to sign a message or to create a digital certificate? Well, this is interesting. So in the encryption case, Alice would take the message and encrypt it with Bob's public key and Bob decrypts it using his private key. To sign a message, we use the other keys and we go the other direction. So we exploit the fact that only Bob can perform this particular transformation and, only, and anybody can undo it. So for example, here's what Alice would do. Alice would take her message, and along with the message, she would send what's called a digital signature. She would take the message contents, in this case this is M, um, and rather than creating an encrypted message using Bob's public key, she creates a certificate using her own private key. So she, create, she uses her private key and she creates a certificate C. And she sends that along with her message. So she sends M and C together, oh sorry, E and C. Uh, so she sends the encrypted message and she sends this digital certificate that she's created using her own private key. Now, she's the only person that can create this certificate because she's the only person that can use her private key. So when Bob receives this message, now Bob is going to get both E, the encrypted message, and this certificate. And so, what Bob does to verify that the message is correct, first he decrypts the message and he gets M, and then he takes the certificate and he inverts this transformation using Alice's public key. Now Alice's public key is out there, anybody can use it. He's saying, okay, Alice said that she sent me this message, how can I be sure? I can take Alice's public key and I can reverse the process on C, and what I should get is M. And if these two things aren't equal, then there's a problem. If these two things aren't equal, it means that somebody modified the message while it was being transmitted. So let's look at what the attacker would have to do. So the attacker comes in here, and now in this case, the attacker, now the attacker can create a new message for Bob encrypted using Bob's public key. That's perfectly possible, the public key's out there. What the attacker cannot do is it cannot create C. It cannot create the digital certificate because it doesn't have Alice's public key, private key, sorry. So what happened is the attacker would not be able to forge the certificate and so in this case, Bob would get M prime and C and when Bob decrypted um, 
uh, sorry, Bob would get E prime and C, and then when Bob decrypted E prime, he would get M prime, and when he, decrypt, when he uh, used C and transformed it using Alice's public key, he would get M, and those two things wouldn't match. So this is very elegant. We have a way to make it hard for, to make it easy for anybody to do one thing, and possible for only one entity to do the other thing. So it's easy to perform this transformation. It's really, really hard for anyone without this piece of secret information to do the other transformation. For encryption, the hard thing is creating the encrypted message. The easy thing for Bob is decrypting it. For digital signatures, the hard thing is creating the signature, and only Alice should be able to do that. The easy thing is verifying the signature. And so the same process of a trapdoor function is used online both to encrypt messages and to sign those messages or to create a digital certificate that is used to verify that the message contents have not been altered. So by, do, by using these two ideas together, and it's really just one idea and sort of using it one way or the other way, I can both keep my messages secure and identify any messages that might have been modified in transit. So this is a really powerful idea, uh, very cool.